Hello and welcome to The Pulse. Many families were out last Sunday celebrating Mother's Day. In some cases, it was their first chance to get together after the partial relaxation of social distancing rules. Many restaurants and shopping malls were relieved to see customers coming back. Young people were also back in several shopping malls for sing-along protests. They and many families just out for the day were met by riot police. Protests and confrontations continued throughout the night in the streets of Mongkok, where journalists faced a new level of hostility from the police. On Sunday night, hundreds of police officers dispersed crowds in Mongkok. Protesters were arrested. Police also asked reporters to throw their press cards and search their bags. Later, they pepper sprayed groups of media workers. Reporters were told to nude and stop recording. This photojournalist was in the media group that was pepper sprayed. Pepper 就叫我拎起記者證和你的ID卡,就逐個影,即我擔心會影得我的資料會令到記者被起底,從而是一種想令記者襟升的方法。Commissioner of Police Chris Tang has admitted that the police treatment of reporters on Sunday was unsatisfactory and has said he will meet representatives of four media associations next week to discuss the issue. Well, with us to talk about the pressure on press freedom in Hong Kong, uh, Cedric Alviani, the East Asia Bureau Head of Reporters Without Borders, who's speaking to us from Taiwan. And in the studio, we have Chris Young, Chairperson of the Hong Kong Journalists Association. Now, uh, Chris Young, if I just may ask you about events last Sunday in Hong Kong, because I think you have described them as, as reaching a new low in relations between police and journalists in covering demonstrations. Why is that so? Well, uh, in our survey, uh, we, we did ask uh, specifically you know, why that happened. I mean, what journalists found the, the biggest threat, threats, uh, say, to press freedom. And uh, unlike previous uh, surveys that we do, uh, well, we do every year, and uh, the threats to personal safety um, is more, say, pressing <coughs> and serious than before. And uh, when asked more specifically, the major source of threat came from uh, police. We are not surprised by that finding because um, there are just massive evidence, footages, photos that show, say, police abuses of power and even, say, in cases, uh, breaches of law and regulations. Um, Cedric, um, can I ask you, I mean, Reporters Without Borders has just issued a report looking more widely but in that particular report, Hong Kong has slid down the ratings. Uh, from your perspective, why is that so? Since our index was created in the year 2002, Hong Kong has fallen down from the 18th rank to the 80th rank, 18280. Is that, is that the biggest fall of any jurisdiction? Oh, there's 
there's many there's many reasons for uh, this downfall but what we have to notice is that it is consistent and this year is unprecedented uh, hong kong has uh, lost seven ranks so of course the surge of violence against the members of the press is the first reason for this uh, uh, fall this year um, uh, since the beginning of the anti-extradition bill protests uh, there has been a consistent trend of attacks against the members of the press that cannot be justified uh, in any case. Uh, members of the press are very clearly identified as, as members of, of the press. They are doing their work and they should be able to do it with the protection of the police and not uh, be the victim of attacks from the police. There's also a constant trend of harassment harassment on the pro-democracy media. Uh, Jimmy Lai, the founder of Apple Daily, was arrested twice uh, in, in a manner that should never happen, uh, considering the, the charges that are uh, reproached to him. Uh, there has been intimidation uh, on the foreign correspondents in the past years. We remember the Financial Times editor uh, expelled from Hong Kong. Uh, and there is globally a growing control from the Chinese authorities on um, the traditional media in Hong Kong. So all this is truly worrying. And let me just ask you, Chris Young, there are people who are posing as reporters at demonstrations who are not reporters, and that reporters are getting in the way of the police in conducting their lawful activity. And it's for those reasons, perhaps, that relations have deteriorated? Well, the, the government has always uh, been trying to uh, muddle the issue of, say, political violence. And the fact that uh, there are more journalists um, on those scenes uh, than many other uh, occasions, for obvious <coughs> reasons, one million people, two million people, dozens of rallies, everyone is a factor. So for all these reasons, people are concerned about it. So uh, a lot of journalists uh, there is a fact. But that doesn't justify the use of force, excessive use of force, and say breaches of law and, 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 uh, and, and, rec and regulations. It is an of offense, uh, say, for anyone. So to block police from um, enforcing the law. Yeah. We, we always ask the police to give uh, concrete evidence. Yeah. Uh, time, uh, and those are details. And what happened then? Uh, why they did not take action? Secondly, uh, yes, uh, they always said that there were so many journalists. So there must be some so-called, say, uh, a fake journal journalists. Um, so far, so far, they, they, they have not come up with, again, uh, specific cases. And those are public areas. And a lot of people taking videos there. Police, police are taking videos there. So why can't they come up with uh, contrary evidence? Now, you're, you're having, I, I think you could describe it as an unprecedented meeting with the um, head of the police, chief of police, on Thursday. What do you think would come out of that? I mean, what would you like to see coming out of that? Well, to us, um, the, the problem now is a police violence. That must be stopped. That must be stopped. Um, so we <coughs> want a, a, a very concrete and uh, assuring, say, um, a, a, a pledge from the government that uh, they, will, they will and they, well, they will take, say, concrete actions uh, to stop that from happening again. And what is your attitude to this proposal that's now floating around, that somehow journalists should be accredited? That's not our system. Certainly to us, uh, there are far more damaging consequences uh, of having an uh, official uh, press accreditation system, because that could easily become a political tool um, to, say, suppress uh, freedom, uh, free and critical in the independent media. Let me just come back to you, um, Cedric Alviani. Um, if you look at the situation in Hong Kong in the context of the world, some people will say, you know, in other countries, journalists are being killed, journalists are being put in jail in large numbers. Is, is the situation here really so bad? 
Of course, it's still possible to uh, do in independent reporting in Hong Kong, and we are very happy about this. But the problem is the example. Hong Kong has been for a long time an example of freedom of the press, and these freedoms are being slowly reduced, but consistently reduced. And of course, it is normal that the Hong Kong residents would worry, and it is not acceptable, because if we accept freedoms to be reduced in uh, places that used to have a high level, then the world will just um, uh, have um, freedom violators everywhere. Furthermore, when you see that so many reporters, which are professionals, which are seasoned, uh, it's not true that uh, only uh, students or non-professional reporters are being the victims of police violence. Every reporter, I believe, is afraid of uh, being attacked by the police currently. So uh, it's, it's not acceptable and it's already reaching a, a very worrying level. Well, Cedric Armani, thank you very much indeed. And Chris Young, we'll be back after the break and we'll see you then. Welcome back. Last week, we reported the problems relatives face looking after family members during the coronavirus outbreak. However, not all of those with physical disabilities or other impairments have family members to care for them. They rely heavily on government or subvented organisations to provide assistance on a daily basis. However, many of these welfare services have been cut, posing even greater difficulties during the pandemic. Many welfare organisations have begun ramping up their services on a limited scale since the decline in the number of locally transmitted COVID-19 cases. Some aren't sure when they will be able to provide a full range. Many of those services, whether provided by the Social Welfare Department or NGOs, have been partially suspended since late January due to the pandemic. 11 services, including residential care, home care services for people with severe disabilities and integrated support services for people with severe physical disabilities have been provided only on a limited scale. From mid-April to 1st of May, Labour Party lawmaker Fernando Zhang conducted a survey on the impact of the suspension of daycare and home care services on people with special needs. 203 people responded, 98% of whom are either disabled or suffering from chronic conditions. 64% of the interviewees receive subsidised house cleaning services. 71% of that group said the service has been totally suspended during the pandemic. Some personal assistance services or rehabilitation services are being called to resume by the social welfare department. But I understand that the resumption is uh, really varied. It caused a lot of um, deteriorations to many of the uh, disabled or elderly people's uh, daily functioning, uh, functions that they need to maintain themselves in the uh, everyday activities. Um, some of them would suffer from um, um, deterioration in their motor skills. Uh, some of them might suffer from uh, mental stress and also deterioration in their memories and cognition, especially those who suffer from dementia. Uh, we're afraid that some of these deterioration could be irreversible. Chiang kai volunteers for an NGO that provides services for those who require wheelchairs. He has not been able to do his regular physiotherapy for three months due to the suspension of home care services. He can feel that muscle deterioration is affecting his daily life. Because 
喺屋企沖涼嘅時候爭啲扇到，好在我即係誒屋企廁所嗰啲無障礙設施都比較穩陣啲，又及時可以扶住個扶手啫。就呢啲咁嘅例子就係正正就係因為我哋冇經常性去鍛鍊自己嘅體能。Of May, the Social Welfare Department announced certain services would resume in some areas and in phases between May 11th and May 27th. The announcement stated that rehabilitation, family and child welfare services, youth and community services, and residential care homes for the elderly and persons with disabilities would gradually increase their service availability and frequency. But the announcement didn't include a timetable for service operators on when they had to resume their full range of services or the scale of services they should offer. Mr. Choi and his wife live in this public housing unit in Changquan O. He suffers from ankylosing spondylitis. His wife is blind. The subsidized house cleaning service he received from an NGO has been cut down from twice a month to on an appointment basis. He says this poses a risk to his health. Yeah,一個是每一晚其實你都。一個一個一個一個一個一個一個一個一個一個一個一個一個一個一個一個一個一個一個一個一個一個一個一個一個一個一個一個一個一個一個一個一個一個一個一個一個一個一個一個一個一
in a very disadvantaged position because of the pandemic. Other than the $10,000 per head scheme, uh, there isn't any particular scheme that targets most vulnerable groups. We are calling for a resumption of these services as soon as possible, especially for those who are in need of rehabilitation. When we're talking about basic functioning, uh, uh, to maintain someone to live in the community, uh, uh, these activities of daily living have to be performed. Uh, and therefore, these services should be resumed as, as soon as possible. Otherwise, we would be looking at uh, a larger cohort of uh, these needy people needing to go into institutions.